Hello friends, welcome to the penultimate agent of deterioration. That's right, there's only one more agent after this. We've almost made it. Today we're going to be talking about an agent that I've mentioned a few times over this series and I've kept promising you that we'd get to it and today we're doing it. We're talking about relative humidity. But again, just like temperature last time, humidity is not a thing that we can escape. So we're focusing on incorrect relative humidity. Actually, incorrect temperature and incorrect relative humidity work hand in hand as agents of deterioration because they affect each other and cohabitate. They're pretty much a team and you can't split them up. So when you're tackling one, you can't forget about the other. Let's start off with the basics and talk about what relative humidity actually is. Relative humidity, or RH as the professional conservators say, is a measure of the amount of water vapor in the air. The humidity is the amount of moisture in the air. So air can be very humid and wet or not so very humid and dry. We call it relative humidity because it's very dependent on the temperature. For example, when warm air is cooled down, the relative humidity rises. Think about morning dew on your window. The air was warmed throughout the day and then overnight after the sunset, it cooled and then the water in the air began to condense. Remember, hot expands, cold contracts. And the same goes for water. And then when cold air starts to heat up, the relative humidity drops. That's why things get so dry in the winter and we need to use humidifiers to bring back a normal amount of moisture into the air. We can perceive this change in a bunch of different ways. And when we talk about percentage of relative humidity, we're talking about the level of saturation that air at a particular temperature can actually hold. Now, as I said earlier, we're more concerned about incorrect relative humidity because different collections and materials have different sensitivities to levels of humidity. Because of this, it can be very difficult for a museum or archeological storage facility to find the perfect relative humidity for all objects. The best we can do is try to get the relative humidity stable and at a decent range for everything in the collection. Luckily, the range that causes the minimal amount of damage is a lot wider than we previously thought, so it doesn't have to be such an exact and panicky science. There are four main categories of relative humidity when we're talking cultural heritage objects. There's damp, which is just not a fun word, but that means the relative humidity is over 75%. There's relative humidity above or below a critical value for a specific object. There's relative humidity above 0%, and there are relative humidity fluctuations. Damp causes different types of damage, like the speeding up of metals corrosion or mold growth. Damp environments mean that there is more water in the air, and we discussed in this video here just how water could deteriorate objects. The higher the relative humidity, the faster the deterioration happens. So just like with temperature, any reduction in the humidity in the air can really help prolong the life of an artifact. A relative humidity above or below a critical value can also be very dangerous. For example, salts will either crystallize or deliquesce, which essentially means salt absorbing moisture in the air and turning into a salt solution. If salts are absorbed into this water vapor, they can land on vulnerable materials like metal or pottery. Salts in solution are very dangerous to metals, especially iron, and they cause a lot of corrosion. If salts are introduced into pottery and then the relative humidity drops, the salt will actually then recrystallize. When salts recrystallize, they grow. Salts, when they recrystallize, actually take up more space than when they were in solution because they form into more of a crystalline solid. And the crystal that's formed takes up a lot more space than the salt in the solution does, and a lot of pressure then starts to build up, and they can actually start pushing out of the surface and taking material from the object with them. It's just a lot of bursting of salts out of surfaces of pottery and it's just not it's not fun. Unstable glass is also very vulnerable to this critical value. Unstable glass can begin to what we call sweat, which which looks like the glass is actually sweating with all this like goopy water bead stuff. This happens when certain compounds in the glass deliquesce. This glass sweating happens at around a relative humidity of above 55%, which is not super, super high. But as I said, it only happens to unstable glass, which is glass that wasn't manufactured with materials or techniques that make it quite stable to fluctuations or just stable 
in general. For the next one, when we talk about relative humidity above 0%, we're really talking about when any level of water vapor is incorrect. This is mostly for acidic paper or old acetate or nitrate films that have a lot of chemicals inside of them and they decay very rapidly. The type of decay that these materials suffer is something called acid hydrolysis. This decay requires any level of moisture to be in the air. So any presence of water vapor will just spark a reaction, which is very scary. Of course, a 0% relative humidity is nearly impossible, so decay is just, is just gonna happen. So in order to preserve the object for as long as possible, we go by the rule of thumb, where if we have the relative humidity, we also then have the rate of decay. Fluctuations in relative humidity is also quite a dangerous one. I feel like I'm saying that they're all quite dangerous. They're all equally important. Let's just, let's just put it at that. But change in humidity will also change the moisture content in organic materials, which will then cause them to change in size. This doesn't matter too, too much if the material is free to expand and contract on its own. But if there's anything blocking this expansion and contraction, like a museum support or another sort of inorganic part of an object, or even if the object is just really bulky, the expanding parts might just get crushed or the shrinking parts will just get cracked and have a lot of physical stress on them. Another thing to keep in mind with relative humidity fluctuations is the repetitive stress that the object goes under when dealing with all of this. This constant expansion and shrinking can cause something called fatigue cracking. So those are all of the ways that incorrect relative humidity can affect an object. Now let's talk about where this can all come from. Incorrect relative humidity can be the result of something as simple as the local climate that your objects are in. If you're in a part of the world that's super wet and rainy, like like Amsterdam, then you'll probably have to deal with problems like damp. If you live somewhere that's super dry, it doesn't actually mean that there's a low relative humidity, it just means that it doesn't rain very often. You can live in a hot, humid place. Just look at Florida. It's usually that high relative humidities are intensified by wet climates, and low relative humidities are brought on by cold climates. Because people like to turn heaters on when it's cold outside. Other things that can affect relative humidity are faulty heating and cooling systems, bad drainage, basements that suffer from rising damp or condensation on cold surfaces, and microclimates. Microclimates are created when things are placed near exterior walls, just above a cold damp floor, or just anywhere that has a certain tendency to be affected by something that we can't completely control that's in a tiny space. They create these small areas that create special relative humidities that you won't find in other parts of the room. So they're very very, very specific to the spot and we need to be aware that microclimates can happen and we need to be able to identify them to ensure that the relative humidity is stable throughout the entire room. So with that being said, how do we protect our collections from falling into the hands of an incorrect relative humidity? The best ways are to avoid damp as much as humanly possible, especially in museums. Relative humidity is the best long-term approach when trying to preserve your most vulnerable materials. Stick to the status quo, I guess you can say, and keep the relative humidity as low as possible. Since a material will adjust to the humidity that it's in, avoid fluctuations at all costs and just stabilize it as much as you can. Low and stable wins the race, my friends. It's also a really good idea to make sure that your collection storage and exhibition areas are very well sealed from any unwanted outdoor fluctuations. And you should regularly monitor your relative humidity using a handy dandy device like this or a much lower tech paper version like this. We also use bags of silica gel in cases and storage in order to absorb all that excess moisture in the air. The best thing about silica gel is that you can buy it in these packs that are specially calibrated to a specific relative humidity. And what I love about them is that once they've absorbed all of their absorbing potential, you can dry them back out and reactivate them to use them again. So it's a lot more sustainable. You can also use humidifiers and dehumidifiers in areas of the museum that need it the most, especially if you have one space of an exhibit that requires a very low relative humidity. These types of machines are also very useful in the winter and as well as when seasons are changing because the atmosphere is going to be fluctuating like crazy. A huge thing to remember is that the damages caused by incorrect relative humidity are ones that you can't really come back from. Mold damage is just forever and you can't 
uncorrode metal. If you are a conservator or you want to be a conservator, you will definitely be hearing the term RH anywhere and everywhere. So you really need to make sure that you become familiar with it and that you're aware with what it is and how it can affect cultural heritage objects. Now make sure you subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell because the next video will be the final video in our Agents of Deterioration series. And that is dissociation. It's a long, weird word, I know, but we're gonna unpack it. Big thanks to all of my patrons on Patreon. If you wanna become a part of the Patreon community, the link to that is in my description down below. Here are all of my socials, and I'll see you all again in three days. Stay dirty, my friends.